everyone. Al Diorio here. I'd like to call this evening's meeting of the Huffington Planning Board to order. I show 603. First item on the agenda is a roll call. I'd ask members present to uh, indicate their in attendance. Diorio here. Ron Perlowitz here. Keith Lindelow here. Light here. Emily Shimshinia here. John Pennypacker here. Okay, sounds good. Next item is a pre-roll, prospective member attendance for the June 16th special meeting. Diorio, I plan to be here. Ron Perlowitz, I will be absent. Uh, Keith Lindelow plans to attend. Carolyn Light, I'll be here. Emily Shimshini, I plan to be here. John Penny Packer, I plan to be there. Outstanding, very good. Next item on the agenda, approval of the minutes, May 5th, regular meeting, please. Uh, Keith here, I make a motion to approve as written. Excellent. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Ron Prelowitz, I second. I have a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Diorio, yes. Prelowitz, yes. Lindelow, yes. Light, yes. Shamshinia, yes. Outstanding. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a minute approval extension request pursuant to RI General Law 42467B1, May 19 special meeting. Maybe I'll have Talia introduce this one. Sure. So this is Talia, the senior planning clerk. I consulted with our solicitor, Maggie Hogan, about uh, receiving or requesting an extension for the minutes from the 19th the way that um, the law is written is the minute, and I quote, the minutes shall be public records and unofficial minutes shall be available to the public at the office of the public body within 35 days of the meeting or at the next regularly scheduled meeting, whichever is earlier, except where the disclosure would be inconsistent with 42-46-4 and 42-46-5 or where the public body by majority vote extends the time period for the filing of the minutes and publicly states the reason. So I'm asking for an extension. Um, this would not impact any member of the public's ability to access the draft minutes that I have. Um, it's just that I need more time to complete them before I filed them. Today would have been the day that I would have filed them and I'm about an hour and a half into the last meeting, which was four and a half hours. So I will just need uh, a vote from the board that basically says we're extending this uh, time period to file the minutes so that they can be completed. Uh, if you've read the memo that I wrote that accompanied this, I believe it was actually posted online as well. Um, but I will just need, I, I estimate that I'll be able to have them done for the 16th of June, so our next meeting. Um, I think that should be sufficient. Outstanding. Seems like a very reasonable request to me. Uh, planning board members, I'd be prepared to entertain a motion accordingly. I'd like to make a motion. This is Ron Prelitz. I'd like to make the motion that we extend the time frame for Talia to compile the minutes. Uh, is that be Carolyn, I second that. I have a motion. I have a second. I, I guess I'm just wondering if uh, I'm, I'm reading the memo again where it talks about and publicly states the reason. Uh, I don't know if, if Maggie is out there. Is our motion as crafted adequate for this? I think that you could you could certainly just indicate that it's for the reasons set forth by um, our clerk. 
Ron, do you think I'd, I'd, be, uh, I'd be imposing on you to add that to your motion? And if Carolyn would no, be no problem at all. so inclined to second that amended motion, is that okay? Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead. I can go through the formality if you want, but if we can just handle it informally, that's okay with me. So I have a motion. Yeah, I'd like I to add that it's, go ahead. Yep. Very good, I have a motion, I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, the Oreo, yes. Prelwitz, yes. Lindell, yes. Light, yes. Chemshinia, yes. Outstanding, thank you very much. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is an advisory opinion. <clears throat> A second advisory opinion to the town council, amendments to the zoning ordinance district use table, appendix A, zoning, chapter 134, section five, filed on October 18, 2020. The proposed amendments would prohibit any additional gasoline diesel service stations and to allow electric charging stations in neighborhood business commercial and manufacturing zones, including the two existing gas stations, proposed and sponsored by former town councilor Sylvia Thompson. So perhaps before we begin, uh, do you think I could impose on Jim to just give us a very brief recap of where we are and what we're expected to do this evening? Jim Lamphia, town planner. Um, Talia did an excellent, excellent job uh, of recapping uh, where we've come with this, the historical uh, genesis of it, and um, where we left off with the planning board. And she went into also where the council left off. And quite honestly, I'm not, I'm not really clear as to what our town council wants from the planning board at this point in time. Um, I thought we were pretty clear with the first advisory. Um, but I'd like to turn it over to Talia because she, she did such a wonderful uh, piece of work here. I'd like her to explain uh, her work and also um, also give, give, give her best guess as to what our charge is here tonight with this ordinance That's and good. what the council wants. Very good, thank you, Jim. Talia, the game, the ball is in your court. Sure, so this is Talia. Um, for, I prepared for the board the original proposal, a table comparing the present district use code, the proposed district use code, and what the board had voted on and what they were proposing as uh, amendments to what Ms. Thompson provided to us initially. Uh, I also provided you with a memo which delineates the review process for this district use table amendment up until this point, uh, the discussion that was had at the council level, the discussion that was had by your, amongst yourselves uh, at the meeting on the 15th of March. No, that was actually the council meeting, excuse me. Third, the planning board discussed it on the third. Um, and finally, I get to the part where it's the board's present task. So I listened to the town council meeting where it was discussed twice. I took some notes. Ultimately, my understanding is that the council has remanded this proposal to the planning board for further scrutiny because they would like a definition for electric charging stations, as well as some standards related to their use and functioning. So instead of rehashing the discussion that the board had on the third, uh, I wanted to just run through a couple of quick points. There are about six. So the first is that it proposes a change in the use code in use code 554 from gasoline service stations to gasoline slash diesel service stations. The council did not appear to need a definition for the gasoline slash diesel service compared to the gasoline service station. Point two. The addition of diesel was purposeful, though it would not prohibit existing gas stations from selling diesel fuel, it would prohibit the creation of any new gas stations that could sell diesel fuel. 
the board already voted that they did not support the prohibition of new gas stations that could sell diesel fuel and instead would require special use permits for that form of development in commercial and manufacturing zones, coupled with an aquifer protection permit in the aquifer overlay secondary zone. The council during their discussion on the 15th broached the special, special, the special use permit issue and seemed to be divided on the subject. In providing their second advisory opinion, the board may want to elaborate on why they believe a special use permit is preferable to an outright ban if the board still believes that that would be a preferable course of action. Uh, as we, so to get to the third point, as we know, the electric charging station would govern commercial ventures in non-residential zones, not residential charging stations. The board discussed this at length at their meeting on the 3rd of March. Um, we know this is not referring to residential charging stations because it would fall under a greater use category, which is use category 55, automotive dealers and gas service stations. Um, in, pro in providing their second advisory opinion to the council, the board may clarify the amendment to provide abundant indication that this use code would apply exclusively to commercial ventures. Point number four, the footnote, unless prohibited in the district use table, would apply to every use in the district use table if adopted as part of this amendment. That was not Ms. Thompson's intention. I knew that from the meeting uh, where she appeared before the town council and explained that that was not her intention. Uh, the board already voted to strike that language from the amendment and they may be interested in reaffirming that stance when providing the council with their second advisory opinion. The last point is the board has not been provided with an ordinance that would govern electric charging stations. They've been provided with an amendment to the district use table that would allow them, but as it stands, it has not been accompanied by any language that would direct elements of site design, lighting, parking for the location, and the like. The board may be interested in gauging the council's interest in the creation of electric charging station ordinance where these standards can be fully fleshed out, but we haven't been given that particular directive from the council. We haven't been told, okay, draft an electric charging station ordinance. Basically, we've been asked to come up with a definition for what an electric charging station is and to maybe give a couple of parameters associated with it. But I think our primary focus should probably be on identifying what definition we would like to provide the council um, and any of the points that I stated earlier, like making sure that it's abundantly clear that this is for commercial use, um, Going back to your your opinion on the special use permit question, and that's about all I have to say about that. I provided you with a couple of different definitions for electric charging stations from a number of different municipalities around the United States. A lot of them are very similar to each other, um, but some provide a little bit more insight into the different levels there are for electric charging stations. I have to admit that I am not um, extremely well versed in this arena, but to learn a little bit more about like how there are different levels to these charging stations and how certain ones can take certain amounts of time to charge. And, and I don't know if the board necessarily wants to get that specific or if they want a more general definition uh, to provide to the council. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Al. Talia, that was very good, very impressive. Thank you very much for aligning ourselves. It makes it so much easier. So just to recap, and again, forgive me, I was not a part of the last discussion, so I'm playing catch up a little bit here. It seems like we have a cup, just a couple of tasks. Mm -hmm. Choose a definition or formulate one. And then in crafting our advisory opinion, uh, embrace some of the topics that you've identified. Special use, uh, reiterate uh, the stance with regards to uh, the prohibited in the district use table, et cetera, essentially one through five. Yes. So if that's correct, uh, I would 
go to my fellow planning board members. I'm sure you've had the opportunity to read uh, Talia's compilation of a few definitions for these facilities. I'm, I'm stepping way outside of my lane here. I know nothing about these. And so let's start to have a discussion about either choosing one that we like or formulating one of our own. Planning board members. Mr. Chairman, could I jump in for a moment? Yes, of course, please. It's Maggie Hogan. Um, the first thing I would suggest to you is that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have a state statute definition of uh, electrical ve vehicle charging station parking restrictions. Uh, Talia has uh, identified for you. So I don't think you need to craft from other places. That's number one. Number two is I concur that um, I don't think you should be getting into s specifics as to level one, level two, level three. All that changes so quickly in this arena um, that you know you could put something very specific in here and by next year, there'll be a level four, there'll be a level five, whatever the case may be. Um, this, is an, this is an area uh, of the law that's, uh, and technology that's changing quickly um, as we speak. <clears throat> Uh, number three, um, you do not need a separate stand. The town does not need a separate standalone ordinance per se. What you would want are development standards to put in the zoning ordinance for this use code. However, I, I'm going to suggest that um, this is not an area in which the board has specific technical expertise and that the town really ought to be supplying the board with a consultant uh, on that matter if they want this particular use code to be added. Um, alternatively, we could reach out to um, the Office of Energy Resources. I know you've had Chris Kearns assisting you in um, with solar information previously, but there may be someone in that office that could uh, point us in the direction. Uh, but, but I don't think it um, is a good use of the board's time to attempt to figure out from a technological standpoint what standards you should be incorporating into this particular use code. It's totally with outside, uh, outside the, your areas of expertise um, that I can see in what I'm hearing. Um, I have some level of expertise in that area because of my day job, but I don't even feel comfortable um, suggesting to you particular use, I mean, um, uh, development standards for this particular use code. So that's my two cents. Very good, Maggie. Thank you so much. So let's just pick it up from your, uh, your astute recommendation that we already have one of the, I'm referring now to the definition, we already have one in front of us. I have this one highlighted in my notes. There's no sense going to Georgia if Rhode Island already has something that does the job. However, I, I did not go to this specific chapter and I'm concerned when I see that it focuses as much on the parking space as it does the charging component. So now maybe you're more familiar with this entire 31, 21, 18, A, but is this going to do the job for us? That's really what I need to know. Um, I'm going to need to get back to you on that. Let me just pull it up. I had it Talia, up last night. Talia, Talia, yes, I'm sorry. Talia. I can, this is Talia. I can weigh in a little bit. I believe, so when I was going, ultimately, I, I do agree. I think that we shouldn't reinvent the wheel and that the the one that's within the Rhode Island general laws will probably be the best fit for us. But I wanted to provide a couple of different options for the board just so they could see what um, other municipal municipalities had in place. My recollection of the rest of this section of the Rhode Island general laws is that it refers to uh, the prohibition of a person parking in the spot if they're not using the electric charging station itself. That's correct. Um, yep. So it's, it's to basically prevent someone who does not need to charge their vehicle from parking in a space that would prevent someone who does need to charge their vehicle from parking in that space. So again, I want to reiterate uh, my, my concern that it, it, seem, it seems that we've focused more on 
the <laughs> restricting the use of the parking area associated with the charging element, then we have defining the charging element itself. So I'm going to come back to my question. Is this definition going to do the job for us? Or is this just going to tell me about what the lines on the pavement mean? This is Carolyn. Can I weigh in? Uh, I, I think if we, if, if we took this Rhode Island definition and we strike um, everything from Rhode Island general laws uh, through restrictions, and we're left with that short definition, that could satisfy the requirement that we have. Okay. I, and I, I don't know if it should be more elaborate than that, but like Maggie said, these things are gonna change and evolve. And uh, we, we'd be locking um, our opinion into something that could be outdated quite soon. This is Talia. Let me just elaborate on that. So it, the the intention of including from Rhode Island general law uh, electric charging stations through parking restrictions, I did not intend to have that be part of the definition. That was just an explanation of where that language came from. Does that make sense? Yep. So you would pick it up from electric vehicle charging station means? Yes. So, <clears throat> Al Diorio, I, I'm certainly in favor of a very broad definition. Uh, we're, we're not building a piano here. This is, this is our charge. Let's get to a definition and move it forward. I, I concur with the idea that this is a rapidly evolving field. Uh, we're way outside of our lane. Let's just do what we can and move forward. So, if somebody would like to elaborate for me on how they see the paragraph coming together, I'd be delighted to entertain that. This is, this is Ron. As I look over the paperwork and listen to Talia and to Attorney Hogan, it seems to me that we're talking about just commercial charging stations. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. We're not talking about home charging. No, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I saw a, a TV interview with Elon Musk and he calls the charging system that he supplies with the car's home charging station. That, I think we're just talking semantics here and we all understand that that's just for the owner of the automobile on their own property for their own use. So Correct. I think to me that's a little bit of a gray area in the, in the paperwork. Other than that, I agree wholeheartedly with what uh, Attorney Hogan said and with what Al said. You know, we've got things that work it has evolved so fast that this may come before us in another year or two years. Again, we have to, you know, plan for today and hope for tomorrow. That's all. Good, Ron. Thank you. So again, if somebody, if somebody would like to read me a paragraph as a proposal, proposed definition, that would be just great. Mr. Chairman, Jim Lamp here, town planner. Can I just interject here? Um, we're looking for the definition of electric vehicle charging station. So we, parking spaces can be eliminated if that's a problem. Electric vehicle charging station means charging equipment that has as its primary purpose the transfer of electric energy to a battery or other energy storage device in an electric vehicle. That's what an electric charging station is and does, period, regardless of where it is. Love it. So, planning board members, how do we feel about that verbiage? This is Carolyn. I, I think it's perfect. This is Emily. I was following along as Jim read in the RIGL 31 21 18. So I think that's perfectly appropriate. I, I have three people that are in favor of this verbiage. Uh, Keith here, I agree too. Four. I'll jump on board. 
five. I'm prepared to entertain a motion to adopt this as our recommendation for a definition for electric charging stations. This is Emily, so moved. There we go, that's all it takes. Do I have a second? This is Ron, I'll second. I have a second, any further discussion? Not hearing any. All, all in favor? Diorio, yes. Prelwitz, yes. Lindelo, yes. Light, yes. Shamshinia, yes. Okay, that gets us over one big hurdle. So now <clears throat> we're down to attaching to our recommended definition those things that Talia have, has identified in her items one through five. And uh, I look to my colleagues to tell me if in fact, uh, or how they would like to include these, this re recapitulation that Talia has put together uh, to flesh out our second advisory opinion. I'll jump in. I was, uh, this is John. I was pretty vocal uh, the last time around and I'll sort of recap the, the thoughts that I had in, in where, at least where I stood. Um, so when I see that the council proposes putting not permitted in many, zo in many uh, zones, I think back to, you know, Emily cited a case where the power was out and half of the town, I don't know, half the town, some number of our residents were dependent upon gas generators. And at that point, it, and Emily defined it as, or, or characterized it as critical infrastructure. I agree with that. I have a gasoline generator, I have a gasoline car, and if I can't get gasoline for those things, I'm, I'm in a really bad way. So I don't think that we are at a point where we can just say, you can't have any more of these and we're going to rely on the existing two or three to stay in business for as long as the residents need gasoline. That's the thought on, on gasoline. The thought on electric charging, I think there are a couple of different scenarios here. Um, you know, one scenario, we look at the park and ride where there are a couple of, you know, electric fuel pumps. Um, you you pull up and you park and you fuel. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the bits that Talia cited talked about accessory use and it's permitted as an accessory use everywhere. The idea I suppose being if, you know, the owner of a restaurant wanted to put up a charging station for its customers, um, they would benefit. So the customer would park, put in their credit card, go have a meal and come out to a, a fully refreshed vehicle. That makes sense. What the flip side of that is, most fueling stations that I see today um, consist of some sort of repair facility or snack facility. It's not simply a, an, you know, a, an autonomous unit. It's a, it's a facility where you can buy spare parts, whether that be spare batteries or motor oil or an air filter. Um, you know, where, where do we want to say, sure, you can go ahead and put this in by right, no problem. And I would, I would feel badly if a developer came to town and said, I'm going to put in a 200 space parking lot equipped with electric chargers um, because it's permitted by right in a neighborhood business. So I think that we need to apply a little scrutiny and think about what sort of charging stations might exist. And it might also, and I don't know if this is overstepping or not, considering the town's stance on solar, I believe it's not permitted to put a solar canopy over said parking lot to power the, uh, the fueling station. So I don't know if that plays into our decision or not, but thinking about what a, a, a charging station would actually look like and what it would be, I think is, is important. John, thank you. So, 
costs. Is this an endorsement of uh, or requesting a special use permit when we're talking about these facilities? I mean, I, I'm rolling it over in my mind and I, I heard a couple of examples that you uh, elaborated on and I could, I could just see a fiasco uh, being generated because it was allowed by right and the town has no oversight. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a restaurant owner deciding to put a couple of these spots in uh, or the guy who wants to put the 200 units in. I'd be an advocate that the town should have some oversight as to how the facilities got put in. There's traffic issues to contend with, there's lighting, there's security. I mean, the ones that are in the park and ride, uh, I think we've been lulled into believing that, you know, that's rather innocuous, right? But try squeezing one of these into an existing restaurant facility. And I think you'd be looking at a whole different ball of wax. So anyway, my question is, is this how the special use permit issue came up? This is John. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you want to go? Go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. All right. This is John. Uh, we had talked about special use in terms of uh, traditional gasoline diesel fueling stations. Um, and that way, there is an avenue to build new fueling stations, but the town would have a little bit of leverage over how and where they could be created. Um, we did not use, I don't think we discussed using a special use permit for electric charging stations. So, so this is, I'm sorry, go ahead. sorry, this is Talia. So I'm just going to read back to you what the board voted on, on the third. So at that point, for use code 554, gasoline diesel service stations, for RFR80, you put N, Res1, N, neighborhood business, N, commercial, special use permit, so S, manufacturing, S, special use permit, aquifer primary, and uh, overlay secondary, A, aquifer protection permit. And then for electric charging stations, you had 559, uh, which is the use code. And then for RFR 80, you had N with a caveat that said no resale of electric chart of electricity from charging stations. You had the same uh, prohibition under res one with another N and then for neighborhood business, commercial, and manufacturing, you put P's across the board um, with A's for aquifer uh, primary and overlay secondary. So what I'm, I'm hearing from John is that you might be interested in instead of having P's across the board in neighborhood business, maybe you would want an X, which would be a special use permit. So there is a little bit of extra scrutiny involved um, if this were to come to pass with the town. So I'm not sure if the board would be interested in uh, supplying a second advisory opinion with that kind of language in it, or if you're comfortable with the P's across the board in neighborhood business, commercial and manufacturing for electric charging stations. So I don't know if you wanna revise like I said, I don't know if you want to revise the motion that you made or if you want to stick with that or. Okay, Al Diorio, th thanks for that refresh. Uh, no, I was not following along. Uh, the board has already voted on this. Uh, I'll stand down on my concern, although I still think it's valid with regards to uh, charging stations in the neighborhood business zones. But again, the table's already been voted on. I don't think we need to revisit that. This is Emily. Um, I, I think uh, John's re recounting of our discussion last time was great. I'm not just saying that because he accurately quoted me. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it is a really um, important point that John brought up in addition. And Al, you could sort of um, reiterated this is that, uh, you know, without any sort of guidance in design standards, for example, through the zoning ordinance, as Attorney Hogan suggested in the beginning of this conversation, I'm not sure we should confidently restate our position about, you know, where we stood in March with this zoning use table uh, revision that we provided to the town council. I think if we wanted to do something sort of quick, 
uh, a special use permit for electric charging stations instead of just you know allowing it in these zones would be the best course of action because that would at least give the planning board some temporary you know ability to review those potential projects more carefully but i think that the best thing for the town to do is to get an expert in here and invest in some guidance on design standards for these types of uses in all the different zones where they might be allowed um, and bring that guidance back to the planning board and to the town council for further consideration prior to updating the zoning, uh, the district use table in any way. Okay. okay, thank you. So is that going to be the second advisory opinion? Town Council, we need an expert. This is Ron. I agree with that. We need more information. I think Sharon has her hand raised. All right. Sharon, to unmute, you press star six. I don't know Hello. if you have raised your hand Hello. because you want us to know that you're here or because you want to weigh in. So well, either first, way. first it was because I wanted to let you know I was here. Second, I was going to add the word commercial in your definition, but that went by. So I don't really, <laughs> I don't really have anything else to say. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. I'll, I'll mute myself. All right. Raise your hand if you have any other things you'd like to weigh in on. Okay. Planning board members, tell me what you want me to do. If it would help move things along, I'll make a motion that for our second advisory opinion on this uh, electric vehicle charging issue, which is the amendments or revisions to the district use table, the planning board advises that uh, the town provide resources for a consultant with expertise in electric vehicle charging station design and development criteria um, and consider developing uh, potential draft guidance and information for further consideration by this board and by the town council. Outstanding. I have a motion. I'll second. This is Ron. I have a second. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, Diorio, aye. Pro with aye. Lindelow, aye. Thanks, Emily. Light, aye. Shamshinia, aye. Tremendous. Thank you all. Next item on the agenda. Let's see, there's no, there's nothing under old business, under new business. A preliminary plan, a public informational hearing, four lot, seven unit major land development project, Fairview Estates, AP18, lot 7K66, Fairview Avenue, Shoreline Properties, Inc. applicant. The applicant and or the representatives present. This is Talia, yes. I've just made Mr. Freeman and Mr. Caffrey panelists. I also made uh, the stenographer a panelist as well. Is, this is Talia uh, for Patrick, is Mr. Catelli in the audience? I don't see him on, uh, you communicated to me that he was probably going to attend via iPad, but I don't see his name unless he's using uh, something else or, or if he's calling in from a cell phone. I, d I don't see him either. Um. Do you think you and Mr. Uh, well, Attorney Caffrey would be able to proceed without him here, or would you like to wait a few minutes? He's, he's actually calling me right now. Uh, I'm just okay. myself. And one, one.
he is unfortunately stuck in traffic, but if we have any questions for him, I can give him a call. All right. Let's continue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you prefer to hear from us first or do you want to hear from the planner? Uh, you, you have the floor, sir. Right, thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Caffrey. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Resnick and Caffrey here on behalf of the applicant, Shoreline Properties, Inc. As we've already seen, I'm being joined by Patrick Freeman and hopefully eventually Mr. Catelli will be with us as well. Uh, we're here tonight seeking preliminary plan approval for Assessors Plat 18, Lot 7K, which is uh, located on Fairview Avenue. It's approximately 13 and a quarter acres and it's situated in an RFR 80 zone. As I'm sure the board is aware, had we gone forward with a conventional yield plan, um, that plan would have resulted in us being able to develop four residential lots. In recognition of the, of the board's preference for uh, residential clusters, we've submitted the proposal that's before you this evening, which would consist of four buildable lots, as well as two open space lots, uh, one of the open space lots to be conveyed to the land trust for the purpose of preserving uh, witch rock. The four lots that we are seeking to develop would contain, uh, three of them would contain a uh, duplex dwellings and one would contain a single family property. Of the 13 and a quarter acres, approximately two and a quarter acres are deemed unsuitable for development, which leaves approximately 11 acres. Of the 11 acres, seven acres are being devoted to open space, which is uh, double that which is uh, required by the ordinance. As part of the proposal before the board this evening, we're seeking a waiver of section 9.2.2D of the subdivision regulations that pertains to the number of duplex units that we could be allowed as part of our uh, submission. Uh, the ordinance makes clear that no more than 50% of the lots can be dedicated to a duplex uh, dwelling. Uh, the proposal this evening is for three. And as support for our waiver, we're relying upon the inclusionary zoning provisions of the ordinance. As I'm sure the board realizes, once we hit that magic number of six units, uh, re we are required to provide uh, an inclusionary unit. And therefore, we would be entitled to a density bonus as well. So the additional duplex that we're seeking permission to build contain the additional one unit would be in satisfaction of the inclusionary zoning requirements. The second waiver that we're seeking this evening is under 9.2.2F, which is uh, pertaining to the perimeter buffer. As I'm sure the board is aware, your ordinance requires 100% perimeter buffer. Uh, the proposed plan essentially contains a 30 foot open space buffer and then surrounded by a 40 foot, what we would call a no cut buffer. And that would be along the Southern boundaries of lots one, two, and three, as well as the Northern boundary of lot four. And certainly in recognition of the fact that there is twice the amount of open space that we're being, that we're providing to the town, I think a waiver under those circumstances would certainly be um, recommendable. Since master plan approval, we have uh, dealt with Department of Environmental Management and we've obtained our insignificant alteration permit, our RIPTES permit, as well as the preliminary subdivision suitability determination, copies of which were included with our submissions. Additionally, uh, Patrick has consulted with the uh, police department, the recreational department, public works, the conservation people, as well as the land trust, and we've received no uh, unfavorable comments. Uh, in fact, uh, several um, comments seem to be in favor of it. Um, at this point in time, I know that uh, Crossman Engineering had raised a couple of points as part of their peer review, and I'd like to ask uh, Patrick if he would go ahead and address those issues. Good, thank you. Sure. Thank you. My name is Patrick Freeman. I'm with American Engineering. We went through two rounds of um, review with Crossman. We submitted an initial plan. They had some comments. We addressed those comments. We then submitted revised plans. Um, the final comments that they came out is the, the memo that you received. Patrick, you've muted yourself. Thank you. Do I have to start over? Did you hear anything? 
Uh, we got to the part where you had sent or you had received the second comments from Crossman, okay. and that that was when it cut off. That that memo uh, should be in your packets. Um, is. Major concern was flow onto Fairview Avenue. Um, we reviewed the plans, reviewed the drainage design. Um, Crossman seemed satisfied with our responses and that the stormwater ponds, uh, the sand filter does not overflow to Fairview Avenue for the 25 year storm and the uh, dry well that we placed underneath the proposed private road does not overflow um, for the two year storm. Um, additional comments include uh, fencing. Fencing was a checklist item that we added to the plans. We didn't add a detail, but we can add that to the plan. That, um, they had a question about no cup buffer. Um, there's a small portion of it that was disturbed. Um, I do have a photo, if I can screen share, to yeah. show that that area has started to regrow naturally on its own. This is Tolly. I believe you have the ability to screen share now, Patrick. Thank you. So as you can see this photo, you've got the toe of the slope, which is um, evident on the contours on the plan set. Uh, for the majority of that toe of the slope, um, it's outside of that 40 foot no cut buffer. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's you know, a significant stand of, of small pine trees that have already started growing in that area. Um, that will be allowed to continue. So they, they wanted mostly, uh, they were looking for if plantings would be required. And I would say that the natural vegetation has already started to take root. Um, and that's all for Crossman's comments. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Good, thank you. Any I'm other? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was going to say, I don't really have anything further to add at this point in time, but be happy to turn it over for any questions that members of the board may have. Outstanding, thank you. Sure. So we'll start with planning board members. Uh, if there are any questions, concerns, questions of the expert, this would be the opportunity. Planning board members first. This is Polly. This is Ron, I have no questions. Sorry, this is Talia. Just a quick interjection. Steve Cabral is in the audience if any board members have questions that he might be able to answer for you. Just so all of you are aware of that. Yep, so Al DiOrio, let, let, me, uh, let me hold on that. I was not aware that Steve was in the audience. Steve, welcome aboard. Uh, it might save some time if I just query you. There's been a recap by the applicant's expert as to your comments. And I just want to make sure that you believe that those are accurate portrayals. Oh, good. Good evening, everyone. This is Steve Cabral from Crossman. And, and yes, Patrick did summarize my latest memo. But I would like to add, in addition to two memos, over the past few months, there has been quite a bit of correspondence between our office and American Engineering. And the reason was our goal was to you know, make sure all concerns were conveyed to American as quickly as possible. So we don't necessarily always wait until we publish a, an official memo. And I will say American has been very responsive. And the, the two remaining issues were the, the buffer. And the reason we mentioned that up, that comment is that on the site plans, it shows that, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, on the aerial photograph, it showed that there was quite a bit of clearing in the the no cut buffer. So we just wanted to make sure that the condition of that buffer was known to the, the planning board so that you all could render it an opinion as to whether or not there should be additional uh, evergreen plantings to protect the neighbor. In regards to drainage, uh, Patrick has done a great job responding to our comments over the past probably five months. The only concern that I have with the drainage and before I express this concern, I want to say that Patrick did design it to meet all of the town and state requirements. Uh, my concern is that because we have 
a stormwater pond way that the border of uh, Fairview, if it's not built and maintained properly, it's going to be very obvious that it's not working. And I just want to make sure that construction oversight and long-term maintenance is a critical part of any condition of approval because we have another site completely unrelated to American Engineering and Fairview where we've had in Hopkinton a stormwater pond which was designed so that there'd be no overflow during the 100 year storm. And anytime it rains, it overflows into a town street. And the reason for that was just improper construction. So that's one reason we continue to stress the fact that construction and long-term maintenance is going to be critical for the success of this project because I would hate to see a small subdivision be built and have this infiltration pond overflow into Fairview and have public works and the public getting upset. So again, construction oversight and maintenance will be key. And uh, thank you for giving me a few minutes. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, it's Maggie. Could I jump in for just a moment? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cabral, in your memo, uh, you made a recommendation, I believe, that all rooftops and driveways that drain towards Fairview shall discharge into on-site drywalls. Is that still your recommendation? It, yeah, basically what American Engineering designed meets all of the standards. But because of the concerns that I expressed, if there is any, I know an old fashioned term, maybe belts and suspenders could be incorporated, I would recommend it. So that's an additional mitigation measure, correct? It is, it, it would be above and beyond what's normally required. Okay, and the second item that I picked up in your report was the infiltration system that overflows into Fairview, pardon me, Fairview Avenue. Um, might be able to be increased in size. Could you talk to us about that? Oh, that was a comment that if there is an issue with construction and maintenance, that one of the mitigation measures may be to actually expand the size. Now, the way American designed it, it is sized properly. It's the appropriate size, and there's no reason to expand it larger than what's proposed. My point was that if there is a problem, it would be great if it's possible to reserve space so that it could be enlarged. And, and the reason is, the way the standards that the state enacted are established, they assume that everything is built properly and everything is maintained properly and works 100% efficiently all of the time. But as soon as a system is built, of course, sediment builds up and as sediment builds up, the infiltration capacity decreases. So again, it's more of a belt and suspenders and I'm not implying that uh, Patrick didn't design it properly. He certainly did. It's, it's really to protect the community. So if I understand you correctly, your recommendation is that in the event that the maintenance is insufficient or fails, that there be an area whereby this infiltration could be increased by the homeowners association eventually. Is that and correct? That, that's a very good state summary, yes. Okay, so if that's the case, could you tell us or advise the board uh, where on the site plan you would recommend that additional area be uh, preserved? Is it in the open space? Uh, what, what are we talking about? It, it would the topography of this site is such that the only viable location would be adjacent to Fairview Avenue because essentially this property is a hill and the eastern part of the property actually drains away from Fairview. So the only concern is the, the section of the property that drains towards Fairview and because Fairview is the low point, it would have to be in, in that area. So which lot though? It would be the lot abutting Fairview. Uh, Patrick, parcel could you advise which lot that, is that? That's parcel one. Parcel yeah. one. So there might, one. Be, there might need to be a deed restriction on parcel one 
where it's already encumbered by the drainage, wherein the drainage might need to be, the, the infiltration might need to be expanded on parcel one. Is that accurate? Uh, in, in the perfect world, yes. The difficulty for Patrick, the designer, is that because of the placement of a well for the house in the septic system, the space available is limited. I see a row of, um, uh, I'm assuming ever, it's ever, evergreens on that lot. Yes. Running parallel to the, um, the proposed drainage area. It, would it be adequate to say that it could, that it could be expanded up to, but no further than that line of evergreens? I mean, obviously you have a marketability issue here to begin with on lot one. Um, and you're not looking, we're not looking to um, Im impose additional marketability issues. However, the, you know, the applicant does need to meet all the concerns that the board has in regards to future maintenance and potential future flooding onto Fairview. Uh, yes, that really would be the only location, but the difficulty for the designer would be that there has to be a minimum clearance between the leach field and the infiltration pond. And the way it's located, it's, Patrick can confirm this, but I believe it's at the bare minimum as it is now. That is correct. So, so the suggestion then is really not one that's feasible. Without difficulties, for example, there would be issues that the leach field could be relocated onto lots two and pumps to it. Again, just to clarify, these are all uh, above and beyond the standards. I was just. I understand. I understand. Yes. So the really the only way it could work would be if the leach field was placed on lot two because where the leach field is is really the only viable location to expand the infiltration system. So, so what I'm hearing so that, here is, oh, okay, I'm sorry, Maggie, go ahead. So that leaves a question for the board as to whether or not, um, based on the recommendations, whether some of those changes ought to be made prior to approval of the plan itself. Uh, yeah. for, and that would, you know, that would require presumably you going back to DEM to get that septic system moved um, and, you know, and getting it approved in another location. That slot two would have to have an, a septic easement for the benefit of lot one uh, in order to accommodate that. So, you know, it's, it's um, the yes, recommendation, I you know, causes a number of these things to line up in succession that now need to be dealt with. Yes. The alternative of not following the recommendation is, uh, you know, if the homeowners association does not undertake the maintenance, um, then the town is left with a flooding problem and no practical means of expanding the infiltration on lot one to accommodate an expansion of it. I don't know the answers to all of those questions, those issues, but I'm, I'm just trying to highlight those for the board. You know, one thought, one thought that comes to mind based on Ms. Hogan's very good explanation is that if the rooftops and the driveways were placed in infiltration systems and possibly in placing an easement on lot two for the relocation of the sept of the leach field of lot one, if the need ever comes to be, because if it's not maintained prop, if it is maintained properly, it won't be needed. But if it's not maintained or built properly, at least there could be an easement on lot two where the association could potentially be responsible to relocate the leach field at that time. And that let me let me ask a, um, a question of Patrick, if I could, in connection with that. Patrick, is there a possibility that you that um, that the actual lot line between lot one and two could be moved. You could show an alternate area on two for the, you know, potential alternate area for the septic system in the future if there was ever an issue. 
and then you know some sort of shadowing here of a potential area of increase of the infiltration on lot one. I suspect that may impact the um, density of lot two, you know, the, the overall size of it. Uh, you'd have to tell us and if whether that would then engender the requirement for some type of a waiver of minimum lot size. So there's a there's a lot of obvious ripple effects of, of yep. property mm -hmm. lines and, and moving septics. Um, one thing that I will say is that water quality pond in the operation and maintenance, if that system does start to fail, um, there are steps that you take, which would be to the, the base of that pond is actually all sand. So if that sand clogs up and that's the reason that pond's failing, you're supposed to take that sand out and replace it. And that should bring it to it's as if, if it was a new pond. So instead of, instead of expanding the pond, bringing it back to working order would be the, I think the best way to handle it. Um, and it is covered in the O and M. Um, as far as putting the septic on the other lot, um, the only alternate I can think of that, that would potentially be easier is going to an advanced treatment system if you had to, to reduce the size of it. It's not required. Um, on lot one, you mean? Yeah, on lot one, you yeah. could reduce yeah. the size of the leach field if it became, you know, such a problem that, that you, you um, yeah. the system was just too large. The operation and maintenance is really supposed to, to prevent um, any failure of that pond, as long as it's maintained and installed properly, like you said, that that shouldn't become an issue. There was, there was, an, accompanying, there was an accompanying recommendation that the um, Homeowners Association submit um, reports semi-annually. Do you feel as though um, that's going to be adequate protection for the town from a potential failure? believe so. Jeff, do you have any input on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we can certainly add some teeth to the HOA documents so that the operations and maintenance plans are strictly adhered to. I, I don't know what the periodic reporting requirements would be because I, I don't know how quickly you would get any type of a buildup in there that would, have, that would impact um, its functionality. But I think whatever the recommendation would be, since we're already meeting what the state requires us to do for drainage and for runoff purposes, I'd rather put the burden on the HOA rather than having to re-engineer the whole project due to a what if. Yep, so I, 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 I would rather tighten up the HOA requirements and, and put something in the operations and maintenance schedule where they have to report on, you know, get a, even if they have to get a report from a third party on an annual basis, I'd be okay with that. Um, if it means that we don't have to re-engineer everything. All right, uh, Al Diorio, just a couple of comments here. So first of all, this idea of putting the septic system on lot number two, that's not allowed by DEM regulations. So that's <laughs> off the table. Uh, okay. As for putting more teeth into a document, uh, that doesn't impress me at all. What I really want to know is, in the event that this thing fails, Who's got the money? It would be incumbent upon the, the homeowners association to restore it or to uh, to repair it. And what if they can't do that? Well, I mean, we could we could put we could put a requirement in there that in the event that a third party has to come in there or the town has to bring somebody in, then you've got the ability to enforce that against the HOA. Uh, Maggie, I'm going to rely on you here. Uh, I'm never impressed when I don't have the money in my hand, but in the event that that scenario unfolded, does the town have something to pay the bill? What are we going to do? Well, sell off the lots? Well, if it's just the homeowners association, the only asset that it has is the open space. And what are you going to do with that? So no. then well, it that's becomes, not, that's not good enough for me. Right. We need, so then we the, need, the question uh, becomes whether or not, a, you know, a lien effective against the homeowners association could then be uh, a lien against all of the individual properties within the plat. Um, and that gets attention pretty quickly. Uh, tell you the truth right off the top of my head, 
the mechanics of that, uh, I'm not prepared to address tonight. Um, I, I think it could be done. Well, we're going to leave that to the applicant. But here's my next question. So let's just say that that is a workable solution. Now I have a lien against all these homes. I still have a bill to pay. What am yep. I going to do? Sell the homes? That doesn't, so, sound like, that doesn't sound likely. Right. So uh, the town would obviously need to repair the problem if the Homeowners Association couldn't or wouldn't, if the case may be. And if the town has liens against the various individual property owners, and remember one of them is an affordable unit, okay, um, then the town would have to make um, a financial slash political decision whether it was going to go to court to enforce those liens, you know, against the individual homeowners. Good. I feel like I'm getting mired down. It's getting stickier and stickier. Is there some way to uh, request a, a bond, uh, some kind of guarantee that this facility is going to operate? Uh, before this, this group of people takes, takes this over? Because uh, here's my concern. These people don't know anything about this facility. Quite honestly, I'm pretty sure they're just not going to give a damn about it. So I'm not concerned about the construction. I'm sure the engineering company is going to make sure that it's, in, it's constructed properly. But I can virtually guarantee it's not going to be maintained. So this will fail. How about if we did some type of an annual contract that required somebody to come in there to do maintenance and we'll, we'll obligate for a, a specified time period that, uh, you know, on an annual basis, they'll go in and they'll, they'll inspect it and they'll um, repair it or restore it. And who's paying the bill for that? Well, during the time period that, that the developer owns the property, ultimately he would wind up having to pay for it. But once we turned over control, to the uh, HOA that would become part of the line item budget, similar to insurance on the open space and, and what have you, it would be a budget item. It's, so the money uh, would be there. It's an attractive idea. I have to refer to uh, Maggie to tell me that that makes me feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> Without a blanket and slippers, you want to feel warm and fuzzy. Okay. You understand what I'm com where I'm coming I from. I do. Yep. In the event that this group of people who may not know each other and probably don't care about each other, yep. decide that they're not paying any bills and all this other stuff that accumulates every year, that, well, that can just go south because I'm not paying anymore. When all that happens, how is the town protected? So, um... And by the way, I don't need an answer to that right now, but this is, okay. this is a critical concern to me with uh, a, a drainage facility that's virtually on top of one of the town's roadways. I'm just, just going to mute for a moment. My husband decided to mow the lawn right next to my room here. Just give me one minute here and send him away. <laughs> this, this is Carolyn. Can I ask Steve Cabral a question? Right ahead. Steve, um, you've made uh, two optional uh, recommendations. And during this conversation that we're having, in, in my mind, I'm seeing that the best way to uh, probably address this is to require that the rooftops and driveways drain towards Fairview Avenue discharge into on-site dry wells. It's not um, both you're, you're recommending. Can it be either or? It, 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 it certainly can be either or, but Mr. Diorio was correct that maintenance is going to be key. The more water we remove from the system, the better, but if it's not maintained, it, it could fail. But, but again, just to clarify, um, Patrick did design it correctly and he meets the standards. It's really the Im potential impact if it's not maintained. So, uh, so Carolyn, yes, I, I agree with you. 
it would be great to have the additional dry wells, but we also need confirmation that the system will be maintained. I would like to add that we did install, um, well, we did design dry well systems for uh, the buildings and the driveways on parcels one and two. So we did adjacent to the paved driveway, we added a uh, stone diaphragm with a perforated pipe that discharges to underground galleys. So we did, um, we did meet that request. I, I'm okay. noticing that Patrick Aldiorio, and I did see that you have a rain garden on, uh, uh, let's see, parcel, forgive me, four. parcel four. So, I mean, it looks like you've, you've, you've done, and, and I wanna echo Steve's comments here. It seems like you've done everything that you've been asked to do. It, but my concern is not about your design work. My concern is the subsequent use of the facility. Just wanna be clear on that. So let me ask a quick question too for Patrick on um, parcel one. Could the uh, residential construction and the septic system uh, be slid back on that lot so as to make room for any potential expansion area? Or does that require you to go back to DEM on your septic permit for that lot? Um, we don't have, we have subdivision suitability, which isn't a full. Um, okay. Yep. We'll still have to go to back, back to DEM for the septic design. The, the trouble that we ran into with that parcel in particular was the hill. Um, it's a steep slope. So oh, is that uh, what I'm seeing right behind yeah, the house? Yeah, the, the, the further oh, okay. you move it up the yeah. hill, the, the more difficult okay. it becomes. Got you. Yep. Okay, so uh, again, I, I don't mean to get bogged down here. Uh, I am comfortable with, uh, should my colleagues on the planning board agree, that this kind of detail, uh, providing the town with a greater level of comfort be worked out at the next phase. That, that's perfectly okay with me. I don't need to hold up this, uh, this review. I, I, this, this project has been before us a number of times. I'm comfortable with the direction that the project is moving in. And I'm confident that uh, the solicitors can work out an arrangement that's equitable to all the parties. So I'm sorry, when you're referring to the next phase, would final. that be final? That's final. Yeah, yeah. So this is a preliminary. Yes. So between preliminary and final, you'll hammer out some arrangement. And uh, before the issuance of the final plan uh, or the approval of the final plan, we'll cement some kind of some kind of deal. That's that would be perfectly okay with me. I'm speaking personally. So that would be up to the solicitor and myself to to come to some type of a satisfactory resolution. You would come to uh, an agreement on a proposal, and that would come before the planning board. Or alternatively, if this is going to be approved administratively, the planner would take a look at it and that would be okay with me. If the planner is comfortable with it, I'm comfortable with it. Mr. Chairman, um, if the board is not fully comfortable with all aspects of it at the preliminary plan, I would recommend that you retain jurisdiction to hear it at final. Well, that's, that's fine. Sure, that not, makes sense. Not place it on the planner because then he's assuming responsibilities for something that you have concerns with at this phase. I think that would be uh, putting a heavier burden on the planner. I understand. Is the applicant agreeable to uh, coming before the planning board for the final plan? Uh, the preference would be to handle administratively, but as, as uh, Attorney Hogan said, I don't want to put an undue burden on Jim if he's not comfortable with that. Is Jim here? Uh, yes, uh, Jim Lamp is here. I, I would prefer to see this come back to the, I'd like to see preliminary plan approved tonight and final come back to the planning board with all the uh, details ironed out to the satisfaction of the board. There's a few other things that um, I'd like to bring up in a, in a few moments that need to be worked out to uh, additional details. Uh, Mr. Buford gave me some comments uh, via email on behalf of the land trust. And so there's a few, um, corrections that need to be made in the uh, in the uh, documents open space document etc so i think i think all all that needs to come back to the uh, board okay if 
if that's the if that's the board's wish, then we're fine with that. Okay, good. So, so uh, we're still. Uh, uh, is there a comment in there? Yep, Mr. Chairman. So, um, based on Jim's last comment, there, you, you know, I've given you a draft decision that incorporates the um, the ownership notes on I forget what page it is of the plans in regards to parcel five, which is the open space lot. So I would suggest that you not incorporate approval of those particular elements if there's changes to come. We don't know what they are. So, and the other thing that I did want to point out for you um, when you get to decision time is um, because at master plan, you've already granted the waiver in regards to the density. You don't need to do that again tonight because we are incorporating all of the master plan approval into this level. That's number one, but the item that in regards to the waiver that is still pending before you is the reduction from the 100 foot buffer um, to the 40 feet primarily, I guess it is, no cut buffer. That was not decided upon at master, it was left for this phase. So you do have to um, address that. Thank you. Very good, thank you. So we're still uh, taking comments from the planning board members before we get to everybody else that needs to comment. Planning board members, anything else? This is Ron, I have nothing. Uh, Keith there, Mr. Chairman, you said it well for all of us, so thank you, no comments. No question. This is John. I have one just clarifying question regarding if the uh, the retention system were to fail. The way I read the memo from Crossman says that that would result in flooding about every two years. Is that if it if it if it failed? Is that an accurate description of of what would happen? Oh, if I may, this is Steve Cabral from Crossman. There, there are two infiltration systems ordering Fairview. There's the sand filter infiltration pond, and then there are dry well chambers below the proposed roadway. And so the frequency at which they would overflow into Fairview depends upon the level of maintenance and the degree of failure. So if everything works properly and is maintained properly, the dry well system will actually overflow, say for the once every two year event, but the infiltration pond will not overflow until the theoretical 25 year storm, which is a 6.1 inch rainfall. So if they were to fail, they could theoretically overflow during any type of rainstorm. The, the rainfall precipitation values that I put in the memo represent their design overflow event. And, and just to clarify, currently there is flow from the site that drains into Fairview. And the project was designed so that there's a slight decrease going into Fairview under the proposed conditions. And that's why the dry well system below the road does overflow during the, we'll say the, uh, let's see, the two-year event, and the infiltration pond is allowed to overflow during the theoretical 25-year event. So did that answer your question? I think so. It, it's, it's, I mean, it sounds like it's hard to put your finger on depending on how significant the failure is, but. It, exactly. If, if, the, this system depends solely upon infiltration. Right. And just like a leach field in your, your home septic system, if the bottom of the leach field bed is clogged, then everything is going to overflow. So that's why Mr. Dorio is correct by expressing a concern for maintenance. Maintenance will be key to making sure the bottom of the bed is clean and allows infiltration. Thank you. Thank you. John, you good with that? Uh, this is John. Yes, I'm, I mean, it's, yes. Uh, it sounds like it's the best answer that we can, we can get. I was, you know, I saw 25 year, year flood and, and two year flood. And I just was trying to see if I could 
you know, kind of put it into my own layman's terms, but I don't think it's so simple, but thank you. Yeah, well, I can say in an average year, you wouldn't see the pond overflowing or any effluent from the dry wells. But if in a typical rainstorm, like we've had over the past weekend, uh, let's see, the volume of rainfall that we, we received over the past weekend would be nothing for this site. It, it's oversized to the point that that would be quickly absorbed. But if we had a rain event like we had last weekend and there is overflow, then that's a clear sign the system has failed. Because like, as I said, that pond is sized to accommodate a six inch rainfall, which you know, we typically don't see, you know, except maybe once every two decades. But then again, in 2010, we had a storm we typically don't get except once every 500 years. So it, it's all statistics. Steve, to put that out of the Orioles, to put that into perspective, the rainfall that we had over the past couple of days, I heard three inches. What do you think? You know what? The amount of rainfall varied quite a bit across Rhode Island. So if Hopkinton received three inches, I believe there would have been no overflow from this, this development. Yeah, okay, good. So what I'm trying to do is if in fact that, that three inch value is accurate uh, and that's unconfirmed, but if that's accurate, people might have a better sense of, well, if we had that much rain, you wouldn't see anything coming off this site if the system was functioning the way it was designed. Yeah, yes, exactly. And, and that's why it's going to be easy to confirm if the system works properly, because if we have a one of the mill two inch rainfall and there's overflow, then it's a, it'll be an obvious sign to public works that it's not working correctly. Understood. Thank you. Planning board members, any other questions? I'm not hearing any. So let's move around the table. I certainly can come back to it uh, if something strikes your fancy. Jim, anything else to add on your end? I'd just like to mention that uh, Mr. Harvey Buford gave me an email um, who, um, on May 29th, and he's been working in conjunction with the land trust, and um, uh, he had some comments, three comments. Uh, his first one was uh, sheet three, uh, the ownership notes on parcel five appear to be correct uh, from his read of them. And second observation he had was in the project narrative, uh, number seven, which is in the open space um, section, pages aren't numbered, so I can't give you that, but the open space easement and maintenance covenants, number seven, he says that um, lot number five should be excluded from membership of the homeowners association because that lot is going to be owned by the land trust. And then thirdly, he suggests that uh, in the declaration of restrictions on the protective covenant section, it, it, it should be changed such that the applicant is the entity to install the lock gate drive, the lock drive gate. So those are the three comments that Mr. Buford had on, on behalf of the land trust. And we have no issue with any of those. So I'd suggest that uh, those be incorporated into the final plan. I'd also like to suggest that we have room on the June 16th uh, planning board agenda. If we can get these details that we talked about tonight straightened out, I don't see why we can't bring this right back uh, in two weeks from tonight and get the final plan approved. That would be great from our perspective. The sooner, the better. Okay, I'd like to hear it. Uh, Maggie, anything else to add from your end? Um, that's an interesting proposal. Um, is the suggestion then that we would continue preliminary to the 16th and approve both at that time? My suggestion would be to uh, approve preliminary tonight at the conclusion of the public hearing. We've yet to hear from the public uh, on this. Right, of course, I would, yep. I don't see any reason. I mean, the as, as far as I can see, the engineering has been done. The only issue is 
How is this gonna be maintained? What guarantees are we gonna have? Um, I think the engineering is done. Uh, I don't see any reason why we can't approve this plan tonight, preliminary plan. Although you could bring it back, if you're not, you don't feel comfortable with that, bring preliminary back to the 16th and do both that night, I guess. I would say that uh, uh, I rely on Maggie to be more definitive, but it would be easier to craft a motion if they came back next in, for the 16th and we did a preliminary and final approval all at once. Okay. Because I can already see we're cutting and pasting mm -hmm. as it is. That's fine. Anyway, well, just thought. I, the statutes allow us to combine master and preliminary. I don't know that they allow us to combine preliminary and final. So you would need to list them as two separate items and do them back to back on the schedule if you wanted to handle it in that manner. Or you could, as suggested, you could approve tonight, perhaps the draft, some of the items in the draft would not be included or incorporated into tonight's um, decision. Uh, and then you could do final, uh, now it's just the next month, it's not next month, it's in two weeks. Okay, we'll see. My, we'll see. Oh, go ahead. My, su my suggestion, I like Maggie's suggestion there to do both uh, on the 16th. So we could continue the public hearing to a date certain, which would be June 16th, approve the preliminary plan at that time, and then a separate agenda item following it. New business, final plan, approve the go right, and, go right forth and approve the final plan. Back to back. Makes sense to me. We'll see how the planning board members feel about that arrangement. So uh, if there are no other comments from planning board members, the planner or the solicitor, I'm prepared to entertain public comment from anyone in the audience wishing to be heard this evening on this application. This is the clerk. If you are a member of the public who would like to comment on this application, please press star nine. And I'm going to read off the name that's listed. Uh, then I'll ask you to press star six and then state your name for the record. Cynthia Johnson. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Please state your name for the record. Cynthia Johnson. I'm in Hope Valley, a member of the Land Trust. And I heard Jim's comments um, related to him through Harvey and they are absolutely on point. We like very much the things that have happened. I'm glad that the gate has been sent back to the builder. It has been one of those things tossed back and forth a few times. So it's nice to get some resolution on that, but we support the project. Um, we, especially the open space, the five acres or so both open space and the protection of witch rocks. So thank you to everyone involved, to the planning board and have a good night. Thank you. You're good. Thank you. That's it. Well, okay. So I understand there are no other hands being raised. That concludes public comment. Uh, so planning board members, time has come for a decision on how you'd like to proceed. Give me some feedback. This is Carolyn. I'm on board moving the uh, preliminary and the final to the next agenda. Other planning board members, are we okay with that move? This is Ron. I agree with that maneuver. Uh, Keith here, same. This is Emily. I agree. Okay, then I'm prepared to entertain a motion to continue this. Public informational hearing until June 16th. Yes. 6 p.m. Oh, we do have a member of the public. Okay, well, before we get there, let's entertain the public comment. Planning um, board members, hold tight. Again, as I stated before, I'm going to read the name. Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, 
Um, Mr. Trenholm, please press star six if you would like to comment. If not, um, I'm going to lower your hand. Oh, there you go. You've been unmuted, but we can't hear anything from you. Nope, and the hand has been lowered. Shall we give that individual one more chance or shall I close the door? Kevin, we're going to give you another opportunity. If you would like to comment, please press star nine and then press star six after I give you the directive to do so. If not, okay. We'll oh, press. His hands back up again. Yep. And you've been unmuted. Mr. Trenholm, um, we still can't hear you. I'm not sure. So it, it appears as though you've called in from a, well, not called in, but you're participating via a computer. If you don't have a microphone, we're not going to be able to hear you. Um, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Uh, we can give you the option of calling into the meeting might take a little bit longer, but you're welcome to do that if you are so inclined. Um, that's what I would re recommend that you do because we're not going to be able to hear you in, in this state at this point. lowered his hand, so. Well, I'm alternatively, uh, this individual could uh, return uh, on the 16th. The, uh, the current idea is to continue the public informational hearing. So that individual would have the opportunity to uh, come up with another mechanism for contacting the board. Seem reasonable? Okay. So planning board, <clears throat> I think we we're on our way to a uh, motion to continue. I'd like to entertain such a motion. This is Emily. I'll make a motion to continue the preliminary plan public informational hearing for Fairview Estates until June 16th, 2021, a special meeting starting at 6 p.m. I have a motion, do I have a second? This is Ron, I'll second. I have a second, any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Diorio, yes. Rollwitz, yes. Mandelo, yes. Light, yes. Shamshinia, yes. Outstanding, thank you. See everybody in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> okay, that concludes new business on the agenda. Moving forward, solicitor's report. Nothing to report this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Planners report. Nothing to report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Correspondence and updates appears to be none. Public forum. We have one member of the public. Uh, please state your name after pressing star six, last four digits, eight, two, two, two. Good evening, this is Joe Moreau. Um, as we are all aware, the planning board has had several months where we've had two meetings. Uh, the start time has been changed to 6 p.m. And in some cases, like the last meeting, it continued uh, almost to 1030. Certainly appreciate uh, your efforts in doing that. Um, at the last meeting, one resident spoke for eight minutes and 12 minutes and had the last say for three more minutes. Uh, my suggestion would be is to have a limit of five minutes per person per project. 
Uh, at that point, once everyone has had the opportunity to speak, if time is permitting, you could then speak again for another five minutes. Uh, I attended the workshop uh, recently on the Parliamentary Procedures and Open Meetings Act, and uh, it has to be a consistent uh, time limit. You cannot have five minutes for one meeting and then unlimited discussion for another meeting. So it's just a suggestion um, that I'd like you to consider. My follow-on comments are for informational purposes only. I've had some issues recently with uh, emails. Uh, on May 22nd, I sent to, to Al and Maggie uh, an email with some comments about Title 4246 and also a question I had raised about uh, site visits. Uh, I was trying to get an answer on who would be the person to tell residents to show up that they could not attend that site visit. Maggie did send out a, a, an email to clarify the site visits with the new COVID. And I love the comments about the uh, two by two, thought that was pretty neat. Um, May 20th, I also sent out a email to Maggie about the May 19th meeting and some of my comments. Um, and I also sent that to Al with no response. On May 23rd, uh, I had some questions about that May 19th meeting and I had raised this point with a uh, solicitor Seipel, and he responded to me the next day uh, on the comments. Last night at 8.08, I sent an email to Al with no response. Uh, a couple of months back, I sent an email to Al with no response. In the past, Al has been great about getting back to my questions with emails, sometimes at 5 a.m. Um, He'd also call me at times to discuss different points. I stopped by his home one day and we had some nice discussions. You know, Al had some issues a while back with, uh, with an attempt to remove him from the planning board. And I worked the phones for several days. I sent out several emails to try to get resident support, which we did. And I'm glad to say that, you know, he's been retained on the, on the board. Uh, I haven't been involved long enough to realize that Things have changed the last few months. I would like to ask through the chair two questions. I would like to know if the planning board attorney has had any discussions with planning board members concerning commenting to residents, uh, getting back to residents, basically told not to communicate with residents. My second question is, I still have not received an answer to my question on who will tell residents that they cannot attend these site visits, especially if there's, there's two people there from the planning board or two people from the developer and a resident shows up and they wanna do a site visit. It's not fair if one resident is allowed to do a site visit and the others are not. So again, I appreciate your time, but I would like an answer to both of those questions tonight, please. Al Diorio, Joe, I'd be happy to answer for my lack of response to your recent emails. Quite honestly, if there is nothing of substance for me to say, or sometimes it's better for me to stay silent, I'm not going to respond to you. If you've got a legitimate concern, something that the planning board should be aware of, I'm happy to talk about it. You know that. But the stuff that you're bringing up, Sorry, I'm going to remain silent on that. There aren't any other members of the public wishing to comment. Very good. That concludes public forum. Date of our next meeting is June 16th. It's a special meeting. 6 p.m. start time. Date of the next regular meeting. July 7th. July 7th. 7th. This is Talia. I um, Correct made an error, but I filed the agenda again the day within within the time frame uh, necessary. So there is a 
corrected agenda, both on the town website and with the Secretary of State's office. July 7th, regular meeting. So, hey, what's our start time for July 7th? I was going to ask you that. Are okay. we interested in having a 6 p.m. start time or are we interested in having a 7 p.m. start time? We have advertisements out there right now. Um, for, for the skunk, 7th? Skunk Hill. For 6 p.m. That's a good I question. Believe. I, yeah, probably, yeah. Probably. You think so? I, I would say we should start at 6 uh, in abundance of caution. Okay, let the record show that we're going to start at 6 p.m. on July 7th. And unless there's anything else that can legitimately come before us, I'm prepared to entertain a motion to adjourn. This is Ron. I'd like to make a motion we adjourn. I have a motion. Second, keep on the love. I have a second. Any further discussion on the motion? Otherwise, all in favor? Diorio, yes. Relwitz, yes. Lindelar, yes. Yeah. Light, yes. Yeah. Amashinia, yes. Very good. Thank you all very much for your time. Truly appreciate it. Everybody have a good night.